So acute responses. We walk outside, we don't have time to adapt, we're not prepared, what happens in the body initially to help counteract that exposure? A word briefly on, on how we know the things we know. We looked at ways that we can study. Sorry, I started a bit early. We looked at ways that we can study the responses, but it is important to acknowledge that it's rare that cold is the only environmental stress that will be experienced by an individual. So, uh, cold will often present with disruptions in fuel status or extreme exercise or altitude, like we mentioned. Sleep deprivation, if you're out on a, uh, a long uh, hike through the Arctic Circle, who knows? It's a combined set of stressors that is often going to be specific to the population that experiences them. We will experience cold, but on a daily basis, we're pretty well prepared, and we're not going to have a lot um, or, or, or a large engagement of these acute responses. We wear big, heavy coats. Our car isn't far away. Our houses are warm, and so this is less of an issue for us. But for those individuals where exposure is a concern, it's not only cold exposure, but all of these things. So, so how do we separate them? Or should we separate them? Um, combined stress, like we saw in the heat, stre uh, heat stress section, could also be cognitive impairments. Does that affect the ability of these, uh, these physiological countermeasures to manifest as well? Um, when we're talking about exposure to cold and manual function that we'll talk about in a second, performing the task is really important. Usually performing the task means survivability. But if there's also an impairment in judgment or an impairment in cognition, does that artificially reduce task performance and seem to limit survivability? So the best way to assess cold on its own would be in the lab. We can control it easily with a thermostat. But given that cold tends to present with other factors, do we also induce these other factors in the lab? Does that confound the measurements that we're trying to make? And, and how many do we induce in the lab? Do we make um, a representation of an Arctic ex uh, expedition where we bring in people, we dehydrate them, we keep them awake, we make them exercise, and we make them cold? Is that ethical? For that matter, should we even do laboratory studies then? Because if we can't force these stresses on the individuals, for whatever reason it doesn't go through REB, the Research Ethics Board, do we want to know what the singular response to cold is when all of these things are present in the field? Should we just go to the field? Is that a better representation of the the whole environment exposure to those individuals. And that has the added concerns of uh, the resources required, money to fund that, uh, that research, but it's certainly more ethical and it's specific to the population. You really have to ask what your question is. Do we want to know the mechanistic understanding of these responses, in which case, uh, case laboratory, or do we want to enhance external validity? Do we want to apply these to someone? In which case, maybe field is the better answer. Really, both is the right answer. We want to make sure that we know what happens on a basic level, and we want to apply it in the context of the environment. Now, acutely, the things that happen are mainly twofold, vasoconstriction and shivering. And these are analogous in the heat stress section to vasodilation and sweating. When we had an increased heat load, the body got too hot, we had to get rid of it. How did we get rid of it? We sent hot blood to the skin, and we sweat so that evaporation would pull heat out of the blood. Those were our two main acute responses on the heat stress side of things. On the cold stress side, because the flow of heat is opposite, we want a slightly different response. We are vasoconstricting the skin, which means less hot blood goes to the surface. That's good. Hot blood then stays inside the core, 
it doesn't lose heat to the uh, the environment. If heat become or sorry, if the cold stress is extreme enough, we will also induce shivering, which generates metabolic heat. If vasoconstriction isn't enough to prevent the leaching of heat to the environment, well, we're going to try to make more heat internally to offset that outflow of heat, to maintain temperature and account for that outflow of heat. So these are the two primary responses that uh, the body will engage in order to stave off acute cold air exposure. So how? Vasoconstriction first, shivering second, in that order. How? There are a couple competing theories, and there are still a few um, details to iron out and some controversy. It seems that there are local, direct um, temperature relays in the arterioles of the skin. So the arterioles are sensitive to temperature itself. The first branch of vasoconstriction is that the skin being cold makes the arterioles constrict. Nothing systemic, nothing magical, but it's a local neural reflex. The skin is cold, the arterioles constrict. And this is a, a really simple way to approach the problem. If your skin is cold, that means it will lose heat if hot blood is present. So to prevent that, let's turn the valves. We'll close the taps, remove hot blood from the equation. It's not at the skin that's exposed. It's not going to be lost to the environment. This is a really elegant and simple solution um, to, to combat that problem of losing heat to the environment. But it's not that simple. Nothing ever is. This exists. This is a response that exists. But not only would it happen in my hand if I put my hand outside, the arterioles would constrict, the blood flow to my hand would go down, but it would happen in my other hand. I put one hand outside, keep one in the room somehow, I break the window. Vasoconstriction in this hand with a cold skin, vasoconstriction also in my warm hand. For that matter, vasoconstriction can be measured in the face. That's not the hand. That's not cold. So while there is a really simple and elegant reflex that says, okay, if my skin is cold, shut off flow, prevent the loss of heat, there's a relay somehow between that local area and other areas of the body, maybe as a protective or preemptive mechanism to say, well, if this part of my body is cold, it's likely other parts will be cold as well. Why don't I just start to vasoconstrict everywhere to retain and store hot blood near the core, to retain body heat? So we want to understand this mechanism a bit more. What is the reason that this simple reflex exists and how would we ever connect it to other parts of the body? Because this is such a quick response and a widespread response, the immediate candidate is the nervous system. Really quick relaying of signals across the entire body and we can modify this response using nervous interventions specifically. So it seems that the sympathetic nervous system is involved in this acute relay. Local skin cooling seems to affect constriction through a norepinephrine dependent manner. Norepinephrine is the, um, the catecholamine, the, the neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system. That's released from sympathetic nervous fibers, and that's what speeds up heart rate. That's what vasoconstricts. It binds to adrenergic receptors that initiate a, a cascade of responses. But if it's there, 
It's the, it's the messenger of the fight or flight mechanism. It's do something. It's take action. If norepinephrine is there, that response is activated. And it seems that cold releases norepinephrine from the end of sympathetic nervous fibers. This, how, how, how am I going to frame this? The release from these neurons is due to cold. Cold makes the nerve fibers release norepinephrine. It's not a signal that comes from the brain initially. Cold does it directly. And there are proteins inside the ends of the neurons that respond to cold. You might remember voltage-gated ion channels when you talked about um, action potentials way back in AMP. Channels that respond to voltage. There are channels that respond to concentration. There are channels that respond to heat as well. There are channels that respond to cold. The shape changes when it's cold, and that releases norepinephrine directly. Locally, that signal activates constriction. It's a very acute, quick method of constricting. But this is backed up by a second redundant mechanism if cooling persists. Norepinephrine happens quickly, but then if the, the skin stays cold, if the skin gets colder and it's not being fixed, if I'm not removing my hand from that environment, the stimulus is larger, and then other signals come into play. One of them is reactive oxygen species. And you're right to think we usually always mention reactive oxygen species when we know something happens, but we're not sure of the exact details. We kind of lump it all in with free radicals or ROS. There's a host of different signals that characterize the, the reactive oxygen species response. But we can measure a ramping up of ROS produ uh, production with persistent cold. So we can see that shown here on this, uh, this schematic. This is skin, uh, a zoomed up, close up version, uh, sorry, figure of skin. In response to cold, we have uh, the arterial down here with the vessel. Here's the wall with the endothelial cells, the smooth muscle cells that help to constrict the vessel. And then these are the nerve fibers that if you started to exercise, would constrict the arterioles. Or if blood pressure dropped, would constrict the arterioles. These are the normal routes for constriction of the arterioles. Now in this environment, all of a sudden everything is cold, and localized cold releases norepinephrine from the junction directly. It's not a signal that comes down from above. Norepinephrine binds to the vascular muscle cells here, and we're going to ignore all the stuff in the middle. I'm not going to test you on calcium and rho kinase. Um, we're going to say that signals happen due to direct binding of norepinephrine that cause vasoconstriction. So this branch happens acutely in response to localized cold. What's not shown here is that while cold will release norepinephrine directly, after that's been activated, the brain senses the change in temperature at the skin and then adds a layer of redundancy. It activates these nerves to increase the release of norepinephrine if the signal's large enough. This allows for a graded response. If your hand's cold, you get some constriction. If it's really cold, the nervous system releases more norepinephrine, you get more constriction. And if it's severely cold, to the point where you can affect metabolism, you see the increase in free radicals, or reactive oxygen species. That's what mitochondrial superoxide is. That's one kind of reactive oxygen species. If it's cold enough that you impact metabolism within these smooth muscle cells, 
the appearance of free radicals through some signals will also reinforce the vasoconstriction response. So we have these layers. If your hand's cold, there's a local reflex. If it's really cold, the nervous system gets engaged. And if it's extremely cold, metabolism is altered. All of these things vasoconstrict to prevent warm blood from losing heat to the environment. Now, it's easy to see here the local response. I put my hand outside, my hand constricts. What's harder to see here is the, uh, the systemic response. That these nerves are activated, that the signal coming from the brain helps to constrict them, doesn't only activate the arterioles in this one local area. Turning on these neurons will also turn on neurons in the same motor unit, neighboring uh, neurons that, that also innervate arterioles. Um, neurons that innervate arterioles across the body. The sympathetic activation is what constricts systemically. So then what's the consequence of this? Immediately, less hot blood goes to this area, which is good. Less hot blood means less blood, means less fuel, means less oxygen, means fewer hormones, blood supply is reduced. That's good insofar as maintaining temperature. It's bad insofar as maintaining uh, metabolism of the cells or activity of the tissues. So this pervasive vasoconstriction compromises function of the distal tissues. And this is really evident at the fingers. And that compromised function is what we call a change in, in manual function. Manual function, manual dexterity. The fingers seem to be very susceptible to this um, vasoconstriction for reasons we'll talk about coming up. And you've all felt this, right? Your hands start to get cold. They don't move as quickly. Or if... Um, I always feel it in my nose. If you try to scrunch your nose when you're outside, and it, like, it seems to take a while to unravel or like thaw back out. Hands are the same way. The, the tissue is cold. The muscle is cold. The, 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 uh, the dexterity is reduced, and you don't have as much manual function. Why are the fingers so susceptible? few reasons. Let's assume that they are insulated really well, but oftentimes they're not insulated that well. Gloves can be pretty warm, but sometimes they're not as warm, so maybe the cold exposure is greater at the fingers. That can contribute as well. But regardless of isolation, the fingers are very thin. They have a really high surface area to volume ratio, which means there are a lot of places for the cold to affect the fingers and very little meat, very little substance that is warm that prevents the cold from seeping into the digits. That substance is muscle mass. That's where heat is generated. There's a lot of bone. A large proportion of the fingers are bone. There's some fat. And then maybe half, I would say, is, uh, is muscle mass. Still a relatively low heat generating tissue, high surface area, and low volume. And they have a high circulatory capacity. Your fingers being some of the most sensitive tissue on the body. You have a lot of nervous innervation, so you can feel things. The tactile sense is very high in your fingers. They're very, um, they're, they're highly perfused. There's a lot of blood flow to the hands. And that parallels the amount of dexterity that you need at a given tissue. You don't need as much for your forearm or your upper arm because the dexterity there is much lower. You do linear motions. You don't do really fine motor control motions at your upper arm. You do it with your hands. So you need a high circulatory capacity. Well, that means 
Heat has a lot of access, high surface area. Uh, there's little defense, low muscle mass, and then any cold is immediately carried throughout the blood to the rest of the body. So shutting off vasoconstriction, shutting off blood flow here, means large reductions in blood flow because of the high circulatory capacity, and therefore large rapid cooling of the tissue, large rapid cooling and reduction of function. They don't look like it, but these are uh, about 10% of your body surface area, just the hands. All surface area combined, your hands are about 10%, which is, I think, somewhat surprising. Lots of surface area. So we can observe skin blood flow drop sharply. This response to vasoconstrict is one that helps to sequester uh, hot blood near the core, prevent it from losing heat to the skin. But this doesn't hold out. Skin blood flow returns even if the cold stimulus persists. And this kind of flies in the face of the mechanisms that we just proposed. There's the local cooling reflex, the neural reflex, metabolism can be affected. All of those things want to constrict the vasculature. And if the cold remains, all of those things should be on. The vasculature should always be constricted. But if you measure temperature at the skin in the hands, you'll see it drop sharply, and then it starts to come back. With sustained exposure, blood flow returns. The fingers get warmer, and then they drop off again. They get warmer, and they drop off again. And it's termed the hunting response, because when it was first observed, it looked like the, uh, the blood flow in the hands was searching for the right flow. It was undulating up and down. It got too low, so it went back up. It got too high, so it went back down. And it was hunting for the right blood flow. Or it was hunting for the right temperature. Blood flow being, uh, bringing hot blood back to the skin. This response is, is repeatable. And we don't call it the hunting response anymore. It's called cold-induced vasodilation which is a, uh, a secondary effect of prolonged exposure. It's this cyclical, intermittent warming of the skin. Usually the amplitude is about 10 degrees. So skin temperature will, will go up by 10 degrees, down by 10 degrees, and undulate back and forth. And our best guess is that this is to protect the tissue. Yes, we shut off blood flow to protect core body temperature. But shutting off blood flow makes the, the tissue susceptible. The tissue gets cold and it can, um, it can be damaged. If the tissue gets too cold for too long, frost nip and frostbite, and we don't want that to happen. So the way that we try to protect against that is by employing this cold-induced vasodilation to warm the skin briefly and then cool it back off again. We're sacrificing some core body temperature to protect tissue in the skin and maintain manual function. So this is what it looks like. If you have uh, an electrode or a, a thermistor that measures temperature at the hand or temperature at the finger, it's a little bit lower than body temperature normally, but still pretty stable, about 35 degrees. And as soon as you um, put it into a cold environment, this is, uh, this is probably immersion in cold water or ice water. Um, as soon as you put it in a cold environment, you get this rapid drop in finger temperature owing to a reduction in finger blood flow. We know this. This is the constriction of the arterioles at the skin. We want to preserve body heat. This is the response to preserve body heat. While that's good and we protect body heat, we don't want the fingers to be susceptible 
We don't want them to get damaged or the cells to crystallize and freeze. We don't want frostbite to set in. We want to maintain dexterity. And so cold-induced vasodilation occurs here. The skin warms briefly and cools back off again. It warms briefly, it cools back off again. And then in this experiment, we're removing the, uh, the hand, we're, we're removing the, the stimulus. So it doesn't keep going on this trace, but it would keep going up and down and up and down and up and down if the, uh, the environment remained. We can actually tell a lot about how susceptible an individual is to frostbite by what this trace looks like. And we'll come back and do that on Thursday. We'll talk about why this happens. So far our understanding says that all the signals should always constrict. Cold never goes away. How do these vasodilate? None of the, uh, the mechanisms that we talked about should ever let up. We'll talk about that on Thursday. We'll talk about the, the nature of this trace on Thursday and how we can predict the susceptibility to frostbite. But we'll leave it there for today.